Hello, and welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show, a podcast to help you unlock tremendous growth for your app. My name is Shaman Rao. I'm the CEO of the boutique growth marketing firm, Rocketship HQ, and host of the podcast, Mobile User Acquisition Show. In each episode, we feature experts in the field of mobile growth and discuss strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing. By the end of each episode, you will have gained actionable and tactical insights that will help you make more informed decisions in your own work around growth. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is produced by Meryl Vincent, Content Marketing Manager at Rocketship HQ. Think about something like checkers. Yeah. Checkers is a game that's been played for millennia, but it's been mathematically solved for at least 100 years, right? There is an optimal way to play checkers. Mm-hmm. Or tic-tac-toe, same deal. There's an optimal way to play tic-tac-toe, and yet people continue to play. Why? It's not because the game is particularly engaging. It's, it's pretty linear, and it's been mathematically solved. The reason people play is because there's somebody across the table from you, Right. And there's asymmetry of information. You can see the emotions in their face and you can talk trash and all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. All of that's a long winded way of saying that the players are the content. And so games right. uh, do a good job of turning their players into the content through social interaction are the ones that survive for a very long time. Hello and welcome to How Things Grow. How Things Grow is a podcast about growth and the people who drive it. Join me, your host, Shaman Rao, as I speak with some of the smartest people in tech and go behind the scenes of growth trajectories of companies and technologies that power our world today. We dive into the stories of many of these growth leaders and their companies. We talk about origins, early victories, strokes of luck, troughs of failure, and much more, and deconstruct many of the things they do to drive dramatic growth for their companies and technologies. How Things Grow is presented by me, Shamant Rao, CEO of the mobile user acquisition firm Rocketship HQ. I'm supported today by Catherine Fung, our audio producer. My guest today is Josh Liu. Josh is one of the leading experts in the world on games and on growth in games. Josh is a man who has helped launch and grow many, many hit games. He started his gaming career at Bladen where he helped the game Social City get to 5 million installs in the first week of launch. He was then the founding product manager at Scopely, where he helped grow the daily actors for Dice with Buddies 30X. Yes, you heard that right, 30X. Subsequently, he moved to Zynga, where he served as the director of product for Words with Friends 2. Right now, he's the VP and commercial leader at Blizzard Entertainment. I had a chance to meet Josh when I was at Zynga not too long ago. I found him incredibly generous with his time and knowledge and always eager to see people around him succeed. Today's conversation is a masterclass on games and about what happens behind the scenes that makes games such enjoyable experiences. If you're wondered about why hundreds of millions of players love Candy Crush, Farmville or Words with Friends and spend many, many hours of their days on these games, this interview has some answers for you. We talk about the early days of social gaming, the elements that make games habit-forming experiences, and how Josh thinks about making, growing, and learning about games. We also talk about how the same elements that make for great games also make services like, say, Spotify very compelling. I always learn so much every time I talk to Josh, and this time was no different. Please welcome to the show, Josh Liu. I'm very excited to welcome Josh Liu on How Things Grow. Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Josh. Josh, you graduated in economics, diplomacy, and world affairs. And at the time that you started working in gaming, even the space of mobile gaming was brand new. So what brought you from the liberal arts background that you had to gaming? I went to college not really knowing what I wanted to do, primarily because of games. Uh, I spent my entire childhood life playing games, uh, went to school, uh, knew I needed a job after school, 
Um, I spent school doing a couple internships. Uh, I was in finance for a while, um, but my favorite internship was at a tech company. It was at Yahoo um, back when people still worked there mm -hmm. and uh, loved the environment. Came out of school and thought to myself, all right, well, I really want to get into technology. Uh, and the one big thing I learned from liberal arts uh, college was that uh, the only way I was going to have an advantage in the world was to do something that I really loved and that I really felt connected to. Uh, and so that was my path uh, into gaming. I'd played sort of traditional console and PC games my whole life, mm -hmm. but the space of uh, Facebook and mobile gaming were really exciting to me. And it felt like the intersection of two things that uh, were academically interesting to me, but also just near and dear to my heart. Was there anything about your decision that made you feel like this could actually work uh, long term as a career? There are also a lot of artists, artists, writers who want to do something that they really, really love and feel connected to, but there really doesn't seem to be a career path out there. So was there anything specific around gaming at a point of time when gaming wasn't even an industry that compelled you to pursue that path? It was sort of a, a confluence of a lot of events that ended up working out. At the time, Facebook gaming was just getting big, and I was in the generation that was onboarded to Facebook right as I got into college. And so it was this confluence of things where you know, I loved Facebook as a product. Uh, it helped connect me to a lot of my peers. I was on Facebook all of the time, and so I, I knew Facebook backwards and forwards. I also knew yeah. games. Yeah. And so the opportunity of games on Facebook was fascinating to me because yeah. for the first time in my life, I saw people on Facebook playing games that I never would have imagined would play games. My very, very serious classmates who would normally never play games were sending me fake cows on Facebook every single day. Mm -hmm. And that resonated with me. There was something there. You know, I was a gamer my whole life. And, you know, back then it was only really the nerds in the basement who were playing games as much as I did. Uh, to see my popular friends playing games, it, it struck me that there was an opportunity to turn everybody into a gamer. And Facebook was a really, really good product to do that. So uh, it was sort of that intuition that, that sort of pushed me into that specific field of games. And certainly, we've had many interviews on the podcast where people have spoken about the early days of Facebook. Given how ubiquitous it now is, it's easy to forget how much of a game changer the entire platform was. And if you were to rewind the clock to the start of your career, uh, you started working with Playden and then you worked with Scopely. At that time, social gaming was very new. The world was just about embracing mobile. The world was just about embracing Facebook, as you just mentioned. So how did you learn about gaming and growth back then? And what were your key learnings at a point of time when there weren't any playbooks about how mobile works or how to grow on mobile. The way that I thought about mobile growth was actually born out of what I observed on the Facebook platform, which is to say games on the Facebook platform, they spread virally and Facebook was a new platform and so was mobile. Mm -hmm. And when the platform is new, the barriers to share are a lot lower. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's true when the platforms are new and also when social media in general was new, the barriers to share things were just a lot lower. And so people were willing to send fake cows to their friends, mm -hmm. um, even if they were, you know, professional bankers and doctors and lawyers or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was just, you know, culturally acceptable. And so uh, when the barriers to share were very, very low, the initial playbook for growth on both Facebook and mobile were, well, just get people to share stuff. And yeah. if you prompt them to share stuff, uh, they will end up uh, sharing it and you'll end up, uh, you know, getting a ton of impressions and a ton of clicks and a ton of installs and a ton of DAU. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, very, very early on, the playbook wasn't really a playbook at all. It was just find as many ways as you possibly can mm -hmm. to get people to share on as many channels as they could and force them through that flow and send to as many people as you could every single time. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the concept of viral cycle time, our goal as growth PMs very early on in the platforms was just 
shove people through the funnel as quickly as you can mm -hmm. and get to invite as many people as you can. These days, the playbook has evolved where you know, the concept of viral cycle time is not, not much fo more focused on retention, right? Get people mm -hmm. to stick around for longer and they'll have more opportunities to invite folks. But back then, mm -hmm. it was very much just brute force getting people to invite. Got and it. I, I'd add the other thing that we did to that end was we spent a lot of time as growth PMs early in the platform trying to reverse engineer uh, channels right? As soon as a channel burnt out on Facebook, we'd move to another channel. On mobile, yeah. you know, I remember early days, an experiment that I ran where I got people to connect their address book and then mm -hmm. send a mass SMS to their entire address book for a small incentive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a horrible user experience, but, you know, yeah. probably indicative of, of the time. And you did mention that a key area of focus was the viral cycle time and how to optimize it, right? For those of our listeners who may not be familiar with it, can you explain what that means? And also speak to why that has changed over the years, because you did say that that isn't nearly as important these days because retention is much more important. So can you explain that? Sure. So viral cycle time is just the concept that um, it's the measure of time uh, between when uh, a user will invite their friends mm -hmm. to your product. And so if you can get your users to invite their friends more frequently and be more viral yeah. more frequently, uh, you'll grow. Yeah. Decreasing viral cycle, cycle time is still important. But as user preferences have changed and people have gotten more familiar with the platforms and uh, less okay with being forced down flows or not particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. Our users, our players these days have a very high bar for what they send out to their friends, right. which means that the viral cycle time is less inorganic now. It's much more organic. People will invite when they feel that they have something worthy to share. The longer you retain a user, sure. the more chances you will have for them to come up with some content that uh, meets that bar to share with their friends. Cool. Got it. I guess that also ties into what you said about mobile and Facebook being completely new media at the time. So people were more open to sharing. The bar was far lower at the time. As you experimented with virality at the time, as you experimented with getting people to share more and more often and more and more aggressively, what were some of the things that surprised you at the time? The single biggest thing that surprised me early on was that, um, you know, people would share basically anything. One of the experiments I remember running, it was on Facebook, and uh, we were trying to get people to, um, to share uh, Facebook requests with their mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. They were already sharing at a very, very high rate, but the, the one copy change that I remember that made a significant difference was instead of uh, sending a gift to a friend, mm -hmm. we changed the prompt to say, send this gift to your five best friends. When we did that, we ended up getting way more engagement because back then, folks on social media, the quality of friendship was everything. People wanted to, to connect with as many people as possible. So they were obviously sending it to their five best friends, but they would send it to multiple groups of five best friends yeah. in order to, to look like they were close to lots and lots and lots of people. Right. And on the, on the back side, we actually found that um, people accepted those requests at a significantly higher rate uh, because uh, they wanted to appear like they were best friends. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like such an incredible uh, win for you guys. Even though a lot of companies unlocked a ton of virality and a ton of companies grew. A lot of companies also failed at the time. So in what was, what's been described as the wild west of virality, what were some of the common mistakes that companies made at the time when attempting to take advantage of what seemed like enormous opportunities with virality at the time? Sure. Well, even success stories ended up being, I think, fail case. Mm -hmm. If you think about the very early days of Zynga, 
mm-hmm. Zynga, did, yeah, I wasn't there at the time, Zynga did a better job than anybody of, uh, of taking hold of the viral movement on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Farmville, largely due to the exploitation of Facebook channels, grew to 30, 40, 50 million DAU, the largest Facebook games in the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they didn't do was uh, sort of move off of those same tactics uh, fast enough. Which is to say, if in the Wild West, the channels were open and taking advantage of the channels got you lots and lots of players. And they also allowed you to keep some of those players, right? Because those same channels were used as engagement and reactivation tools. But when the channels went away, you observed that these games hadn't built enough moats to keep people in the experience, that they had relied a little bit too much on the channels and not enough on actual good core loops that kept people in the experience. The, the channels ended up becoming the content versus a really good social experience. The, the, the people and the players are the content. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when the channels went away, and they did quickly, Facebook turned off channels uh, very, very quickly. You observe that those games uh, lost a lot of people, lost a ton of critical mass, and sort of collapsed in on themselves. Mm-hmm. And that was a hard lesson to learn for lots of folks during that time who were relying on channels to get and keep folks. And uh, you saw a very, very rapid evolution of game makers switching their models. Got it. Yeah. And certainly because Facebook really was driving the entirety of the ecosystem at the time, it was hard to imagine that it could turn on many of the people it is feeding until it actually did start to happen. To switch gears a little bit, uh, in your last role at Zynga, one of the things you did work on was Words with Friends, uh, and you were involved in relaunching Words with Friends as Words with Friends 2. Now, this was a pretty old game at the time when it was relaunched. Uh, Can you speak to how the team thought about finding opportunities to relaunch what was a fairly established game at the time? Totally. So I think there were a couple of things going through our head. Yeah. Uh, The first is that, as you mentioned, Words of Friends, it had been around for eight or nine years by the time we launched Words of Friends 2. Mm -hmm. So we've had close to 300 million people download Words of Friends over its lifetime. When you're dealing with something that old and that large, you're inevitably fighting this slow descent into this ground. You're, you're mm-hmm. fighting against gravity. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard, particularly as somebody who grew up as a growth PM, it's really hard to sort of see you know, the gentle erosion of you know, the user base of your product. So that was one driving force where that team tried a ton of things over the years, optimizations, experiments, and all, all those things did was to slow the rate of decline. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so we came to the realization that you know, we needed to, uh, mm-hmm. to, to do something step function instead of incremental. So that's one piece. The other piece of this question is, well, we, we could have built just a giant list of features and, and launched them in the game, but uh, the choice to do a sequel was also very deliberate. Mm-hmm. The choice to create a totally new SKU and migrate all of our players over was uh, mostly due to a quirk of the platform. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for games that have been around uh, for a very long time uh, and who have had lots of installs, it's very hard to get to the top of the charts on mm-hmm. Apple and Google. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the charts are a really good source of organic installs, and organic installs perform significantly better than paid installs. Mm-hmm. And so our whole strategy with relaunching the sequel in a new SKU mm-hmm. was, to, uh, was to actually take advantage of the fact that we could be on the charts. Mm-hmm. We had millions and millions of DAU in our old SKU mm-hmm. that we could uh, basically force through a migration flow, get them to download the new SKU. Mm-hmm. And by virtue of downloading the new SKU, they would actually help us drive up to the top of the charts. Mm-hmm. And the coolest thing about all of this is we knew that uh, getting to the top of the charts required a certain amount of installs, but that you don't really get extra credit for mm-hmm. crushing the number. 
Mm-hmm. And so when we were migrating folks over, we would migrate them slowly and we would drip them through. And so when we got to the top of the charts, we would turn the spigot off and wait until we saw some pressure and then turn the spigot back again. We were actually able to stay at the top of the charts for something like 43 or 45 days, um, which, uh, which ended up generating a ton more organic installs than if we just blew our load from the start. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's pretty incredible because I I think one of the things that is impressive about the new Words with Friends and also the older Words with Friends when it did launch a couple of years ago was just its longevity at the top of the charts. And what wasn't immediately clear was that it seemed to have been a very intentional strategy. Right? And if you have a couple million DAU or MAU, you have a couple hundred thousand people uh, start to download the new app per day. That's all you need to be at the top of the charts. And so it sounds like it was a very intentional strategy that drew a ton of organics just because you guys really, really understood what it took to be on the top of the iTunes charts. That's right. And, and just to close close the loop here, so we picked to release the SQL and a new SKU in order to get lots of organic installs. At the end of the day, it's all a waste of time if if the game isn't meaningfully better and all of those new folks stick around at a higher rate, yeah. right? So there were two things that contributed to people sticking around at a higher rate. The first, uh, and this will sound obvious, is just that there were lots of new people. Mm-hmm. Words with Friends is a very simple game, but at its heart, it's a social game. You can only really play with somebody else. Yeah. The back and forth of me playing my turn and then you playing your turn, that reciprocity is sort of what keeps the game alive yeah. uh, and what leads to very long tail retention curves that we see in the game. So uh, by virtue of having more people, all of these organic installs, um, we observed at the time that uh, retention increased just because there were now more people to fill more matches. The second piece of it is obviously that team, they made a ton of improvements to the game. Uh, and um, built a ton of new features, which, again, for very old players, made the game feel fresh and new and different, and uh, that was also meaningful. So the sequel got lots of new people in, but also kept them at a much higher rate, which was the real success. Certainly, certainly. It wasn't just about getting to the top of the charts, which you could always drive installs, but those users still have to stick around and come back, and that's substantially more effort and time. Josh, something you've spoken about quite a bit is the concept of habit formation through core loop design. Can you tell us about this concept? Sure. Um, so core loops in games are, uh, you know, they're the, the basic action that you want uh, your players to take. If we take words with friends for an example, the core loop is really, really tight. You want people to create games and play their turns. And then they get turns back and they play turns again. So the loop is really just two things. In a game like Farmville, the loop is just a little bit wider, but still very, very tight. You plant some crops, you water those crops, and then you harvest those crops. When you harvest those crops, you get some gold that allows you to buy more seeds, that allows you to plant plant more crops. Mm -hmm. And so the core loop of a game is just... Uh, a, a an activity loop that gets people uh, into the game and then you spend the rest of your game design time building uh, meta games around uh, that core loop so mm-hmm. by planting seeds and then watering them and then harvesting and then getting gold the loop right around that is well the more I do that the more I level up and the more I level up the next loop around that is, well, the more I level up, the more uh, different types of crops I'll have access to. And when I get to a certain number of crops I have access to, suddenly my farm becomes this, uh, this interesting hub for other people to buy and sell goods with me. And it grows and then it grows and it grows. And so um, the, the core loop is the basic activity. And then you spend the rest of your game design time building uh, meta loops and progression loops. Uh, between and around that core loop uh, to make your full game. Got it. And would this concept apply for a digital product that's not a game or to non-digital products at all? 
I think so. And uh, well, certainly some of the, the major concepts do. So one of the major concepts is uh, you want to properly incentivize and motivate your players to go through the core loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to remove as much friction as possible. If you look at the BJ Fogg model of action, it's, it's three things. It's creating triggers. It's uh, removing friction and getting, giving people the ability to do what you want them to do. And it's providing the motivation. All of those things are important in a core loop in a game. And they're just as important in non-game consumer products. Mm -hmm. You have uh, trigger people either through marketing or through internal triggers, uh, timers, uh, or whatever, uh, to get people into the loop. Uh, you need to remove as much friction as you possibly can and let them do what they want to do. And you want to give them some incentive in the end. And, and the incentive, hopefully, is, is variable in nature and the little hit of dopamine changes over time so they don't become saturated. Got it. Are there uh, examples that you can think of outside of gaming that you think illustrate how this works? Sure. So let's look at Spotify. It's not going to look exactly like a loop, but uh, sure. it's got a lot of the same concepts. So on Spotify, I'm sitting there, I'm listening to music, uh, and at some point I really like a song, I add it to a playlist. That playlist, the act of adding that song to that playlist is frictionless. It's one tap. Mm -hmm. And my incentive for doing that is twofold. One, it's to uh, save that song for uh, future use. But the second is actually social validation. At least this is true for me. So mm -hmm. my playlist is public. I have folks that follow me. And when I see people subscribe to my playlist or send me notes about the songs that they like in my playlist, that's that's also another way that I'm motivated to do this action. And, you know, the more I do it, uh, you know, the more interactions I get. And uh, that ends up keeping me in the experience. And like you said, there are very clear parallels in the way users get increasingly invested in the product itself. So you've also worked on and spoken about games that have launched on messaging platforms. Can you speak to some of the key learnings from some of the games that you've worked on on messaging platforms? Yeah, the promise of games on messaging platforms is really interesting. It's sort of going back to the roots of the Wild West days of social media, and not in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about messaging platforms, they are intrinsically social. Uh, mobile as a platform is not intrinsically social, right? Mm -hmm. The beauty of mobile is that it's a, it's a content consumption platform that you can take with you anywhere you go. It's completely accessible, but it's not by its nature something that you do with your friends. Mm -hmm. Messaging has all of that accessibility. It's there with you all of the time. But the expectation is that you're, you're doing the messaging stuff because you want to interact with people all of the time. And you're sharing memes and other content as your primary activity. Mm -hmm. And so when I initially thought about, well, games on messaging platforms, the opportunity is to put games, social games, uh, in the place where people are feeling the most social, and it's with them all of the time, and there are now suddenly new social channels by which people are sharing information. Mm -hmm. That All of that combined was, uh, was a really cool opportunity. Um, the team I was running at the time, we put a couple of games uh, on iMessage and Facebook uh, Messenger, and mm -hmm. particularly on Facebook Messenger, we saw a ton of really, really good engagement. Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook obviously is very good at creating uh, social experiences. They're, they're much more experienced at this than, than Apple is. And so you saw on the Facebook Messenger platform uh, that the games channel there had lots of surfacing points, lots of contextual channels. They did a really good job of surfacing friends. And so the engagement that we saw with the games that we made for the Facebook platform was really, really strong. In the example of Words of Friends, we saw that the Facebook Messenger product ended up becoming an incremental 15% of our DAU and that none of it, almost none of it was cannibalistic because Words of Friends on the mobile platform, primarily older folks skewed heavily towards women, 25 plus, on Facebook Messenger, we saw that our audience was almost uh, universally under 20 years old and predominantly young men, young boys. Yeah. And 
uh, and so that was that was really interesting to us as we not only uh, attracted a new audience that was uh, a significant portion of our existing audience, but that they were completely new to the platform or to the game. And how do you think about what sort of games are a good fit for a messaging platform versus what aren't? It's less about the type of game and more about how you design the game to take advantage of the messaging platform. Mm -hmm. With a messaging platform, there's going to be a lot of call and response type uh, messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, any game that takes advantage of the fact that folks are communicating with each other, not in right. depth much, but very often is really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so that's one piece of it is, can you imagine uh, uh, a game where the output between friends are mm -hmm. short, sporadic pieces of information that occur fairly frequently? So that's one piece. Mm -hmm. The other piece is finding games that take advantage of um, the group uh, dynamic in messaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So words of friends, it's a little bit harder to do this because you're really just playing one person at a time. But yeah. certainly there were games on the on the messaging platforms that did a really good job of this. When you know, when you have group chats, uh, you know, uh, finding ways to involve all the members of the group, incentivizing uh, people to bug the other folks in the group to participate mm -hmm. are, are really strong. And when you have I mean, our observation with other games is. Uh, every incremental person in a group that you got to engage with the experience meant the entire group's retention went up significantly. Uh, and so, uh, so games that found a good way to do that uh, flourished. I also do remember at the time that one of the more popular games at the time on Messenger was Tic-Tac-Toe. You would think it's so simple, but it ties into what you just said about something that ties right into having a back and forth interaction between people. Right. right. Yeah. You know, and you also said, uh, you, and I do remember you saying that long-term retention is oftentimes a function of social experiences. Uh, and correct me if I misphrase this from what I've heard you say, can you speak to how social experiences inside of games can drive long-term retention? Sure. I think the core of this thought is that no game in history has ever been able to capture the imagination of folks significantly beyond the life of the game. And by life of the game, I mean the content within the game. Mm -hmm. The very best games that have survived the longest, you think about um, something like World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. World of Warcraft today launches new expansions every two years and has lots of new content. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look behind the covers, you'll find that people get through the content significantly faster than the two-year cycle. But the, the reason people stick around is because the players become the content. Think about something like Checkers. Yeah. Checkers is a game that's been played for millennia, but it's been mathematically solved for at least 100 years, right? There is an optimal way to play Checkers. Mm -hmm. Or Tic-Tac-Toe, same deal. There's an optimal way to play Tic-Tac-Toe, and yet people continue to play. Why? It's not because the game is particularly engaging. It's, it's pretty linear and it's been mathematically solved. The reason people play is because there's somebody across the table from you right. and there's asymmetry of information. You can see the emotions in their face and you can talk trash and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. All of that's a long winded way of saying that the players are the content. And so games right. do a good job of turning their players into the content through social interaction are the ones that survive for a very long time. Sure. And that makes complete sense because if I remember, even Facebook really flourished because of its emphasis on the social connection, which again is obvious today, but wasn't nearly as obvious in the early days of some of the other social networks, which did not emphasize it nearly as much. And uh, if I remember correctly, Facebook did make this concept much more popular with its precept of getting users to seven friends in 10 days, or maybe it was the other way around. Right? And I think it makes complete sense in that context. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and in that same experiment uh, that Facebook ran in very early days, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we did the same thing and validated at, uh, at now the last two companies I've been at, at Zynga uh, and uh, at Blizzard, right? So mm -hmm. at, at 
Africa, um, we found in Work the Friends that if we could get uh, a new user to play um, three matches with uh, their friends in the first two days mm -hmm. of their install, that they had a step function change in their yeah. retention. Yeah. Um, because their friends would keep them in experience. And same deal with Battle.net. I'm not allowed to show the actual numbers, but uh, our, the Battle.net platform at, at Blizzard has run similar experiments and yeah. we found very, very similar things. So that, this learning is, is pretty ubiquitous. Josh, you've also mentored and taught many incredibly talented product managers by now. What would you say characterizes a great product manager as compared to somebody that's good? The, the very best product managers I've ever worked with mm -hmm. have been ones that are uh, obviously incredibly smart, but the key learning that I've seen, at least in this industry, is uh, an ability to have the intellectual humility to throw away what you know and relearn something very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. You think about just you know my career with games, I started in games the very first company I worked at made most of its money uh, making MySpace games. Mm -hmm. And they switched to Facebook games. Mm -hmm. And one of the companies that I worked at went to mobile games. And there's been exploration now into messenger games. And who knows, maybe next week or next year, whatever, we'll be talking about AR games or VR games or whatever. Yeah. The reality is the platforms... Uh, are changing all of the time and our player expectations are changing all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so your ability as a product manager to uh, understand when everything you've learned is obsolete and you have to learn something new again mm -hmm. is really, really important. Your ability to just cast that information away and then your ability to relearn new stuff quickly yeah. is also really important. And, and part and parcel of that is just a ton of intellectual curiosity, right? The only way you're gonna be able to learn quickly is to be able to uh, you know, take, take a, a hypothesis without any bias and go really deep into it, validate it, uh, understand whether you should keep it or discard it and then move on. Yeah. Um, and so the very best product managers have been very, very good at that. The other trait I've seen in really great product managers is just folks that are constantly getting more data one of the beautiful pieces about working in technology is you have access to all of this data all of the time. And in games, you have access to even more data than, than most other folks, because not only do you have transactional data, you have behavioral data. Mm -hmm. You can infer things about you know, what people are doing. They're voting with their actions all of the time in your games. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but data in this case is not just quantitative. Uh, it's also qualitative. So mm -hmm. the very best product managers I've worked with have also been uh, really, really great at collecting data of all sorts, whether it's inviting people in formally to do uh, focus groups or just standing in line at Starbucks, showing folks an experience, doing your own field work. This is a corollary to the academic curiosity you know, piece is folks that are really good at collecting and then creating yeah. stories out of data uh, uh, end up being good at this job. So I'm also curious though, so for yourself, when you say, it's been very important to unlearn and learn again. I would imagine part of that is to really understand what's going on in gaming, what sort of games are working. And within that context, there's like hundreds of new games coming out pretty much every day. You could practically be spending your entire day playing games. And a lot of people who are not product managers indeed do exactly that. So how do you make time to figure out which games to play, which games to figure out, and when to stop uh, for yourself. How do you make that decision? Yeah, it's very, very difficult to, to scale yourself if you're just doing this by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But, but something that I did at my last job and at this job uh, is um, to take advantage of uh, the crowd. So you get a bunch of people together who all need to be playing games, but all don't have time to be playing all of these games. Yeah. And you just assign it out. And so I, I call it book club. You have a group of folks who are responsible for one game. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some upfront work at determining who gets which game. Mm -hmm. But from then on, uh, you, you do a book report, right? Just like any other book, uh, you prepare, we meet as a group, you talk for a little bit, you share the core insights, uh, and, uh, and that way you get to uh, experience lots of games without actually having to play them super deeply. 
Um, there's another concept that uh, we do that's a little bit more formal, which is we call them deconstructs. Mm -hmm. And you go in, you play a game or a mechanic, you talk about why it works or why it doesn't work, and what are the learnings that scale to the game that you're working on or to the broader portfolio. And it's just hygiene because I think every gaming PM needs to be doing this all of the time to stay sharp and they need to be going deep uh, to make sure that they understand when they play a game normally that they're thinking about the right things, they're asking themselves the right questions. Because there's a very big difference between playing a game for fun and playing a game for research. When you're playing a game for research, you're trying to understand you know, the, the core tenet of playing a game for research is the understanding that whenever a game is designed, every single thing in the game is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to ask the right questions in order to get to the, de the decision behind the design. Uh, and so uh, deconstructs are just a really good way of doing that. Speaking of learning new concepts, learning new things over time and unlearning things, uh, one of the things, one of the ideas or concepts that's really changing growth and marketing, which is where I do most of my work, has been machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's been easy to dismiss some of these as buzzwords, but I've certainly seen how the Facebook platform and the Google platform, at least on the marketing side, have pretty much changed the game very significantly by adoption of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So in your work, is this something that you've seen impact and change the way games are made, games are designed, gaming products are designed? Absolutely. And it's interesting because I think there's potentially space for it, but at the end of the day, you know, games are entertainment products that are meant to evoke emotion. Mm -hmm. I tend not to agree with those purists, which is to say, if you understand that technology as a way for you to ask uh, questions that you would normally ask in a much faster and much more structured way and to get answers mm -hmm. in a much faster and more accurate way, mm -hmm. uh, then, then there's space for AI and machine learning everywhere. In games, this has manifested itself in a couple of ways early on, which I think are really interesting, right? So you know, I mentioned that in games, you get access to lots and lots and lots of data. It used to be that without uh, without these techniques, you know, we'd have to go in manually and try to create stories out of that data ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of stories that uh, we would have never identified ever without the help of ML. Mm -hmm. We discovered totally new segments of players, behavioral segments of players mm -hmm. through ML. It's been really, really fascinating. So that's probably early application. There are lots more, I think, in the future, right? If you think about something like Call of Duty matchmaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, most matchmaking algorithms in games are heuristics based. Mm -hmm. There's no reason they really should be. One of the experiments that we ran in Words of Friends as just a, a blunt force is we thought, well, you know, people that uh, lose a lot might get frustrated and leave the platform. So we actually did this thing where we identified all of the people that had lost three matches in a row, and the next time they got matched against someone random, we'd match them against someone really bad. Mm -hmm. And so they had a really good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And we found that this had a terrible impact to retention, and that the best way to improve retention through matchmaking was actually just to prioritize close matches. People didn't care if they won or lost. Mm -hmm. They only care if they felt they had the opportunity to win and that the game was exciting. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's a heuristics-based way of doing matchmaking. There's no reason why we couldn't leave that up to AI to help us find new matchmaking algorithms that are more optimized or uh, actually serve different matchmaking algorithms to different segments of people. There's no reason we couldn't do that, and you know, that's, that's potentially one future application of, of AI that we just haven't seen yet. Got it. So just so I understand, what you mean by a heuristic-based approach is that the matchmaking was based on certain characteristics of the users that were identified a priori, and with a AI-based approach, you're just saying, look, we don't care what the characteristics are. Let's have the machine figure it out. Is that a fair understanding? Yeah. So that makes complete sense. Cool. Uh, and Josh, something you also do is recommend books for folks that you advise and that you mentor. What 
are some of the more impactful books that you typically recommend to people? Let me start with the, the basic ones. So every yeah. product manager on my team mm -hmm. uh, has three books, and they're pretty easy because they're all meant to be sort of pop culture books. My Reach book is Contagious by Jonah Berger. Yeah. Uh, my Retention book is Hooked by Nir Eyal. Yeah. And then my revenue book is just Predictably Rational by Dan Ariely. Yeah. Um, if folks are interested, in, as I am, in, uh, in sort of uh, behavioral economics and the ways that people uh, act differently than theory might suggest, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I really like the book uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then uh, as folks are moving along their careers and are starting to build out teams, um, one of the books that I really like is called The Rare Find by George Anders. Mm -hmm. The Rare Find talks about uh, finding uh, folks that are uh, two-legged stools, basically, that uh, it's very, very expensive and difficult to get the unicorn candidates, mm -hmm. but that if you can find folks that have one major flaw or that get overlooked by the rest of the market and you can correct that one thing, you end up with these unicorns mm -hmm. um, uh, on the cheap, which yeah. has been a really influential book uh, for how I, how I manage teams. Is there an example of someone you worked with that comes to mind to whom that precept would apply of a two-legged stool? You don't have to name names, but I'm curious. About <laughs> one thing that I'm really bullish on is this concept of bringing folks into uh, product management before they really have the experience necessary. If you look at a lot of the product management programs, like entry-level product management programs at lots of other places, they're typically looking for folks from a top tier B school uh, or from good programs. There is a whole class of folks, fresh undergrads that I am uh, really bullish on bringing into product management very early. Mm -hmm. uh, a, because they get overlooked by the market, but B, because that, that inexperience actually ends up being an advantage. I talked earlier about uh, having the ability to be intellectually uh, uh, humble. Uh, mm -hmm. Fresh undergrads are by nature intellectually humble because they haven't been taught anything yet. Right. And so they don't have to forget anything. You can like indoctrinate them with good habits from the start. So, that's maybe one example of something related that, uh, that I've spent a lot of time on in my career. Interesting. You've worked at gaming for a long time now. Who do you look to for advice and how do you typically approach them if this is in an area that you're not super familiar with? Sure. I, I, I'd answer this broadly, which is to say I've yeah. always um, managed my career like a product manager. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, I collect as much data as I possibly can and find uh, the areas of leverage uh, that uh, I need to improve and then go out and um, systematically improve those things. The way that I do that is, let's say there's something that I wanted to add to my skill set or wanted to improve on my skill set. Mm -hmm. I would find the person in my network that was most well known for being good at that thing and I would go to them. And I would uh, you know, ask for their advice on this one thing. And at the very end of the conversation, I would say, and I'd really appreciate it if you introduced me to the top person in your network who's good at this one thing. Uh, and one person in your network that's really, really good at this other thing that I want to get good at. Right. And uh, that, uh, that has worked out really well for me um, because... You're always interacting with folks that are socially validated to be good at the thing that you right. want to get better at. And it's just a good excuse to, to network with people. I am by nature an introvert, and so that's a forcing yeah. function for me to go invite folks. And it also leads to a warm introduction, right? Yeah. If I can email somebody and say, hey, uh, this person that I really respect in my network and that you really respect in your network uh, called you out as being really good at this one thing, and I'd really like to pick, to pick your brain on it, that ends up being a much warmer introduction than anything you could possibly write on your own. Indeed, indeed. And when you speak of the area of leverage in your career, to the extent you're comfortable sharing, what would that area of leverage be right now? And is that an example you can give of how you're approaching it? Yeah, at, at, at the moment, the big opportunity I'm thinking through is, I'm at a new company where mobile is a new thing, right? So mm -hmm. uh, Blizzard has been around for almost 30 years. Uh, the 
the, the company has done things in a way that has made the company extraordinarily successful for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, mobile as a platform is new and it requires the company to do things a little bit differently than they're used to. And so one of the things that I'm focusing a lot of my time on at the moment is building out a narrative that shows folks that while the technique for making games on mobile uh, might look different, they share a lot of the same things. And that narrative um, is something that I'm trying to work on, which is mm-hmm. how do I tell the story that makes sense to a primarily design-driven organization where I've primarily worked at data-driven organizations before. Yeah. Uh, and so to that end, I'm actually going to uh, to folks that work here, quest writers mm-hmm. and narrative writers, folks that work on the lore of our stories right. and picking their brains on what is the language that's effective with folks that care about this stuff? What is the story arc that makes sense? And you know, it, it sounds kind of kitschy. Does the, the narrative story arc for something like uh, Diablo work for something like this? Well, it actually does because in a culture uh, that cares deeply, deeply, deeply about this kind of stuff, that language and that arc actually does make a difference um, when you're trying to build an organization. And Josh, uh, what is something you're excited about going forward in your work around gaming or anything else at all? I'm really excited to see the continued evolution of the gaming space. So one of the trends that I'm observing at the moment and that I think is really good for players is that the the focus uh, is of of game makers mm-hmm. is starting to become less focused on the platforms, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you're starting to see uh, technologies uh, like Stadia, uh, companies like Epic that are making games that are um, that for the end user can be played in any number of ways, right? You can play on your PC, you can play on your phone, you can play on your console, you can pick up and leave off wherever you want all of the time. Mm -hmm. And for a game nerd like me, that's sort of the dream, right? Is your gaming experience shouldn't be confined to, uh, you know, whatever device you have. It should be, you should be able to experience it uh, all of the time. And those are truly immersive experiences that have the best chance of sort of creating like this uh, ultra long-term retention that I love. So it's one of the things I'm really excited about is how that manifests itself uh, as we see more games that are built for every single device out there. What does that mean for social interactions? If I can now literally 24 seven interact with people in a game, what does that mean for a guild feature where uh, you know, now people are expected to be online all the time? Or what does that mean for virtual friendships? All this stuff is really exciting to me. Could you tell our listeners how they could find out more about you? Totally. Uh, you, can, uh, you can find me uh, on, uh, on the web. I blog sometimes, rarely. My uh, blog is at uh, josh.lu. Uh, you can also... Um, just email me if you have any questions. Uh, my email is me at josh.lu. It's really simple. Wonderful. We'll link to all of that in the show notes, highlights, and transcript. Josh, it's been an incredible honor having you. Thank you so much for making time for How Things Grow. Thanks for having me on. This is really fun. Hey, guys. This is Shamant again. Before you go, I have a small but very important favor to ask. If you get any pleasure or inspiration from this episode, Could you please leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform, be it iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast fix? This podcast is very much a labor of love. It makes no money, and each episode takes many, many hours to put together. When you leave a rating or write a review, it not only means a great deal of encouragement to me, but it also supports getting the word out about how things grow. Thank you again for listening. And I look forward to seeing you with the next episode. Thank you. From more tips, pointers, and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition, subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog.